Good evening, my name is Ted Williams. I'm the secretary of the Rittenhouse Astronomical Society. Uh, it's been my privilege for the last eight years or so at every one of our meetings to introduce to our audience our president of the last 34 years, Dr. Milton Friedman. Ladies and gentlemen, our present president, Dr. Friedman. Thank you, Ted. It's a pleasure to be here and discuss our Rittenhouse Astronomical Society with you. It's uh, a society that has changed considerably from its origin in 1888 to still be in action in 2013. For the past 34 years, you've been the president of the organization, and that has given you the honor of handing out the Rittenhouse Medal. Uh, the Rittenhouse Medal dates back to almost the beginning of the organization. Could you tell us a little about, about the medal? The medal is given out to someone that is outstanding in astronomy in the world. We bring them to Philadelphia and uh, it's our honor to give them the silver medal for their work. The Rittenhouse Medal has a story behind it itself. Um, I know that David Rittenhouse was once one of the leaders or the president of the Franklin Mint. Um, how did the medal come to be? Uh, it came to be in the uh, 200th anniversary of David Rittenhouse, his birth. And uh, there was a major celebration in Philadelphia to honor the history of David Rittenhouse, who has the name of our society. And uh, David Rittenhouse uh, was born in actually 1732 and died in 1796. And he was the first director of the United States Mint. Uh, but it was really around 19, in the 1950s, that we started to give our silver medal the honor to someone in astronomy. So the silver medal dates back to the 50s, 1950s. During that time, you estimate how, about how many times have we awarded the medal? 20, 30 times? The medal's been given about 20 times, and uh, in 1988, this is the first time that we actually gave the medal to a husband and wife, Carolyn and Eugene Shoemaker. What was their contribution to astronomy? Why were they selected for the medal? All right, Eugene Shoemaker was the person that really planned all the trips to the moon by the astronauts. He himself could not go for health reasons, and he married a woman who was a retired school teacher, but became interested in comets. And she went on, Carolyn, went on to discover more comets than probably any other woman in history. I hear many people talking about the Rittenhouse Blue Book. Uh, the Blue Book to me seems to be a history book of sorts. Can you tell me a little bit about it? It is a basic history book. It goes into astronomy when David Rittenhouse was really our our major finder, he born in 1732 and died in 1796, and uh, became self-taught and uh, became the first director of the U.S. Mint. That was one of his, uh, besides making the most unusual clocks of the century. He was spectacular, and we still uh, look up to some of his work, which was never never improved upon. Uh, the Rittenhouse Society really didn't come into existence while David Rittenhouse was living. Um, didn't it have its roots traced back to Camden, New Jersey? Yes. Uh, the Rittenhouse Society actually first uh, began in 1888 and was considered uh, probably the uh, second oldest amateur society in the country, of which there's over 260. Now. And uh, in the beginning, it met in Camden and uh, met a few times a year, and then was invited by the Franklin Institute to meet in Philadelphia, and it met in what is now the Atwater Kent Museum, and uh, has been we've been meeting since 1888. Um, when I came on the scene. 
one of the speakers that made a big impression on me was Brother Guy, the uh, uh, Vatican's astronomer. Any memories about his talk? Yes, I had one very, very interesting uh, memory about Brother Guy. Brother Guy is the Pope's astronomer. He comes over from Rome and he spoke to us at the Redden House. But what had happened, I tried to plan everything and I got up there to introduce him in front of 300 or more people and I heard a phone ring. And uh, unfortunately, I had forgotten to shut off my cell phone. And the audience was now starting to smile and laugh, to which I said, please, Brother Guy, wait. God is calling. And the whole audience broke into laughter. And it was an enjoyable evening, and he was very, very good and very informative. In working with an astronomy organization such as Rittenhouse, we all can leave our mark as speakers or educators. Um, how has Rittenhouse affected you? I, I feel very inspired, especially for the young people, because astronomy is one of those subjects that most people really do not benefit from financially or in any other way, but it is interesting. And I find it is a, a rewarding experience if we can get young people want to know about the sky, the heavens, the stars, the planets, without any need to have a financial success from this. It's interesting you bring that up, financial success. Um, working with Rittenhouse, I see my time as an investment in the future of education. I don't see it as a monetary or a profit return that comes to us immediately. I, I agree with you. Astronomy really is an investment in our future. It's a way we can get our, our younger people to dream on in the future, too. Um, of the years that you've been at the Rittenhouse, is there any meeting that almost totally fell apart? Well, the, the important thing is if a speaker is speaking on too high a scientific level that the audience cannot grasp or understand, then we know in a way, we have failed. We have to back up somehow and make sure that the audience understands what is going on and why they're showing interest in this subject. So after all these years of sharing your expertise with Rittenhouse, it must have had some effect on you. Can you tell us how, how has Rittenhouse changed you? Well, it becomes almost like a compulsiveness to be involved with people that sort of depend on because they want to learn a subject or they want to be part of a subject. And I feel that uh, as president, there could be no greater honor than to be there to help people learn and understand something that perhaps they'll never use in their occupation or life. Is there anything that you look back over the years that you think, well, Rittenhouse shouldn't have done that? What should we have done? What did we miss? I think the one thing that we missed in the earlier years was not spending enough time to find out the level of interest of the audience or knowledge of the, that the audience had. And you assumed that they're all super astronomers. And this was, I feel, not correct. I think the best thing would be to make sure that the person in the audience understands the subject here that the speaker is speaking about. What I've found very interesting over the years is Rittenhouse has a little bit of a dilemma. Because of the prestige of the Franklin Institute, our speakers tend to be very high-level speakers. And yet, because of the nature of the Franklin Institute, this learning center open to everybody, our audience really does tend to be a very wide assembly of people. Although we do have some professionals who understand all the astronomical terms, I found many nights that it's many beginners really looking for a night out in a museum or a night to spend out in a planetarium, and they're looking for that very basic entry-level skill set. Um, I've always found it interesting looking for speakers that can walk that line, that can take everybody to the next level in their interest, but also attract that person who's out for a great night in a museum. This is excellent. Yes. I didn't mean to, I just no, took no, it away. Is, but, okay. This is exactly what it's all about. 
uh, I think it's our job, our function, to make sure that the audience understands what we're talking about. They would not go to a theater and, and listen to a show, or Shakespeare or something, and then walk out and say, I didn't know anything about what they were talking about. They would have felt that was a lost evening. And we don't want that. We want to help them. Um, also, it's now 2013, so we're 125 years past the beginning. Um, because you've been president for so long, I have a feeling that some of our members might have a little bit of interest in your personal background. Um, we all refer to you as Dr. Milton Friedman. We probably don't know what you have your doctorate in. And um, I have a feeling, looking around the home here, an awful lot of typewriters, it seems you're very active in journalism. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself personally? Over the years, I've written over 1,600 newspaper columns. I'm the medical and health correspondent for a group of newspapers at Circle Philadelphia. Uh, and I always, here too, find it a challenge that if there's anything that anybody does not grasp or understand, be it on health or whatever the subject is, we'll get an answer. If we don't know it, we'll get someone that will help them. No one will ever be embarrassed because they don't know something. We're there to help. So it's interesting. I've looked at some of your articles and how you try to help people. You've been doing this mission of education for quite a long time, whether it's astronomy or whether it's uh, medicine. Um, do you see yourself as an educator? Absolutely. It's just so rewarding to be able to get some subjects across that someone will understand and enjoy but also to know that we're there for them if they have any problems with the subject. Well, it's been great speaking with you today about Rittenhouse. I'm sure we'll have some more questions and might want to come back in the future and do a little bit of talking with it also. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Thank you.